we invite you to join us this Sunday and every Sunday morning to hear the word of our Lord as it is proclaimed at St. Mark's Lutheran Church, Onalaska, Wisconsin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The text for this morning is written in St. John chapter 15, verses 11 to 17. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. So far the text. Dearly beloved, in the letter to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul summarizes the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. And you notice perhaps that the first two were love and joy in that order. This morning's text is all about love, love for each other. Nothing would please the world leaders than to have love, joy, and peace on a universal scale, but it's never going to happen because the devil substitutes hate for love and sadness for joy and war for peace. And even we Christians, because of our human nature, find it very difficult to love one another because our natural inclination is always to put what we want and how we feel above all things. And that eliminates the possibility of humbling, caring for the rights and privileges of others. When God first put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he made them in his own image, which means they loved God, God loved them, and they loved each other, and this was to go on for all time. And then the devil broke in and said, you know, I can make you even happier than God does if you will only listen to my suggestion and make your will supreme. And so man tried that and fell into sin and lost the image of God for all time. But the devil is very clever. Ever since that time, he wants to convince us that we're still made in the image of God. He tells us that when children are born, they're innocent and pure and that they learn evil only from other people which denies the Bible doctrine of natural depravity and eliminates all need for infant baptism. Because you see, if we're all made in the image of God, we don't need Jesus Christ. Editors and philosophers come up with editorials that tell us that peace is just around the corner, that God is good, that we're all made in the image of God. All we have to do is think a little deeper and then everybody will love everyone else. In fact, there's one of the new translations of the Bible 
that introduces this devilish error is we read in the translation of Genesis 9, 6, in the image of God has God made all mankind. Well, he hasn't. All mankind lost that image of God in the fall into sin and placed themselves squarely under the verdict of the Almighty, thou shalt surely die. We're talking about joy. And there's very little happiness in our world just because the devil doesn't give what he promises. The devil promises joy if you don't follow what God wants and do just what you want. But you know in the end that only leads to regret and sadness and disappointment. Or the devil says, if you really want to be happy, give in to the lusts of your flesh. And the Bible says, they that sow to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Or the devil says, find your joy in your money or prestige or even military glory. But that cannot give you this inner love. That's possible only through Jesus Christ. God sent his son into the world to renew that image for us because of our disobedience by the perfect obedience of his son who carried our sins to the cross so that by faith, through repentance and renewal, that image is restored into the hearts of a believer and we can, in some small way, love him and love our neighbor as he would have us do. Less than 24 hours before his crucifixion, Jesus preached one of the longest sermons in the Bible. And in that sermon, he told his disciples exactly what was going to happen on Calvary, the pain and the misery and ultimately the resurrection. And when the disciples heard it, they were appalled. And they were filled with fear and misgiving. And sorrow filled their hearts. And they were sorrowful because they forgot the resurrection. If after Jesus died, he stayed in the grave and that's the end of it, that's nothing to be happy about. And Jesus read their hearts. He turned to them and said, because I've said this thing, has sorrow filled your hearts? I want you to be happy. And then this unique statement, I told you these things that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. He died to make us happy. His greatest joy was giving his life for them, his dear friends. For we read, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Only two places in all the Bible does Jesus call his disciples his friends. And what a comfort that must have been for the disciples. He was their friend in spite of the fact that they failed him so often during his ministry. He was their friend, even though they didn't deserve it. Even though they didn't make him love him, as if you can make somebody love you. He was their friend because he'd chosen them. As this text plainly says, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you. He chose them to show their great love to him for his love toward them and to show their spirit-inspired love in the relationship with one another. This is my commandment, he says. Love one another as I have loved you. When it comes to the passion if we were in the position of the disciples in this text, how would we view the suffering of our Savior? 
I think it would be with sadness and grief, but not over what this Jesus had to go through, but because of our own sin and unbelief, which from our point of view literally nailed him to the cross. Listen to the writer of the Hebrews. If they fall away, renew them through repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God anew and put him to open shame. It's right to view the Savior's passion with repentant grieving, to use a word from one of our hymns, knowing at the same time that everything happened on Calvary is a reminder of our sin and our need for repentance. Repentant grieving, that's nothing but sorrow over sin, is not reserved only for Communion Sunday or for the Passion season, but for every day of our lives. Each time we say in church, I have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Each time we pray in the Lord's Prayer and forgive us our trespasses, we're approaching the throne of God in sincere sorrow over our sins. And with each repentance comes the wonderful joy of forgiveness because we know that he sacrificed his life in order that we might live eternally. From this text, we see one other thing. We see that some of the bitterest words of the Bible are the source of the greatest joy. When we study our Savior's passion, both as it was prophesied and fulfilled, we see the things that he went to, but not to make us sad. These moments that he was literally crushed by his father, where he was cursed by the father that sent him, did not happen to make him sad, but to relieve us from the sadness of the cross. Of course, we rejoice that our sins are forgiven. And yet, you know, joy and love, that emotion of the heart, is one of the hardest to come by. We rejoice, and yet we find it hard to keep that level of joy as we go about our day-by-day -day work. We suffer pain and trouble, and we have difficulty in rejoicing or rejoicing in view of the complete moral dead, absolute end of any kind of conscience in our world today. And in these moments, the writer of the Hebrew says to you, forget yourself and keep your eyes focused on the cross. Quote, if our Savior endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him, how much more should not we, his dear friends, find his joy as a source for joy in our lives? You know, in the morning service, we say and sing some beautiful things. And yet, because we say them Sunday after Sunday, we tend to take them for granted. I like to think of only one, that beautiful prayer at the end of the sermon, where we ask the Lord to cleanse our hearts from all evil, and then to renew in us the joy of his salvation. As you say every Sunday, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with a free and joyful spirit. Christian joy, real Christian joy, is not a giddy or superficial emotion that we have to put on. 
Because Christian joy runs deeper than that. It's deeper than even trouble and sorrows. Christian joy is nothing we have to put on because it simply happens. It's a joy that the Spirit inspires and then leads us to show our love toward God and toward one another. Quote, love one another as I have loved you. Love your fellow man by sharing the joy of forgiveness, by sharing the wonderful comfort that he cares for his children in every need, and the joyful hope of everlasting life in heaven with him. Amen.